Rocks. How valuable is one to you? Not very, I assume. But what if your neighbor also really wants this rock? The very same neighbor you've been feuding with for a long time and with whom you share a complicated, even tragic history. Suddenly, it becomes more than a mere stone. It becomes a symbolic centerpiece of a conflict which has little to do with the rock itself and everything to do with the relationship between you and your neighbor. This is basically the situation we find in the waters between South Korea and Japan. Here, a relatively small rock formation is the subject of one of the world's more obscure territorial disputes. The Koreans call the rocks Dokdo, while the Japanese know them as Takashima, and internationally they are sometimes referred to by the French name, the Liangko rocks. And although both Koreans and Japanese lay claim on it, it is South Korea that has the de facto control of the rocks since 1954 when it built a coast guard base and lighthouse on it. Despite their relatively small size, the Dokdo Takashima rocks had an enormous impact on the post-World War II relationship between South Korea and Japan. The conflict was instrumental in delaying the resumption of diplomatic and economic relations until 1965, and even after, it remained a powder keg which would often strain the country's relations to the fullest extent. So let's find out more about this conflict. Why are South Korea and Japan fighting over these small rocks? And how did this all come to be? Geographically, the Dokdo Takashima rocks are located between Korea's Ulengdo Island and Japan's Oki Islands. They are of volcanic origin, fairly barren, with no natural fresh water supply. So, the first thing you might be asking yourself is, do these rocks have any economic or strategic value that could explain the dispute? And the answer is, well, not really. The waters around Dr. Takashima have been a popular fishing ground for Korean and Japanese fishers alike for centuries and competition was fairly common even before the territorial dispute existed as we know it today. But since the end of World War II, South Korea and Japan have had relatively successful and stable cooperation around fishing in these waters and established common fishing areas, so this factor is less of a problem today than it was in the past. The existence of other natural resources such as oil, gas or precious metals are at best speculative and are heavily disputed among scholars. Some people will argue that the rocks could expand the exclusive economic zone of whoever officially owns them. However, it's very questionable whether they could even qualify for having such a zone according to UNCLOS, the International Treaty on the Law of the Sea. But there is certainly another economic factor which might be surprising to you. Tourism. Despite their isolated location, the Dr. Takashima rocks have become a popular tourist destination, mostly for South Korean citizens. Before the pandemic, the island received more than 200,000 visitors a year, but its popularity as a tourist destination is hardly enough to explain why South Korea and Japan are finding these rocks so important. What about the strategic value? Well, for modern military means, the Dr. Takashima rocks are fairly insignificant. The South Korean Coast Guard base, located on the rocks, does not really improve upon the country's national security and is mostly there to secure South Korea's de facto control. And even if Japan would get hold of the rocks, it wouldn't add to its national security either. So what else can explain the motivation behind the conflict? As we discussed in the beginning, the conflict is fueled by one thing in particular, and that is symbolism. The relationship between South Korea and Japan is put it mildly, complicated. On the one hand, it is characterized by ancient cultural ties for which trade goods, technologies, religions and philosophies were exchanged for mutual benefit for centuries. And on the other hand, it is marked by the horrors of war and exploitation, especially during the 20th century, when the entire Korean peninsula was under Japanese imperial rule. This is what makes the conflict about the Dr. Takashima rock so significant rather than the questionable material value. To really understand the symbolic value, we need to take a look at the broader history of the Dokdo Takashima rocks and also the development of Korean-Japanese relations. The early history of Dokdo Takashima is disputed, so it's best to examine the Korean and Japanese point of view. According to the Koreans, the islets were considered Korean territory since antiquity, a time when Korea was still divided into several feuding states. One of these states was the tiny island kingdom of Usanguk, which ruled over the larger island of Ulengdo 
and supposedly the Dagdo Takashima Islands as well. The small kingdom existed until 512 AD when it was annexed by the expanding kingdom of Shilla. However, the first real unification of Korea would take place in the 10th century with the establishment of the Kingdom of Goryeo, which in turn was succeeded by the Joseon dynasty in the late 1300s. The Joseon eventually unified Korea in the basic shape we know it today and would go on to rule the country until the 20th century. But when they came into power, the little rocks and islands between the Korean mainland and Japan quickly became a major problem for one particular reason. Pirates. These pirates, known as the Voku, consisted mostly of Japanese peasants and runin, masterless samurai looking for easy treasure. For centuries the Voku plundered the shores of East Asia and little islets such as the Dokdo Takashima rocks were frequently used as bases and hideouts. The Voku became such a serious issue for the Joseon government that in the early 15th century it signed a treaty with the Japanese clans responsible for most of the pirate activity. The clans agreed to spare Korean trading vessels, while the Joseon government agreed to pay a yearly fee to keep it that way. From then on, the pirates would focus on raiding the coasts of China. Additionally, the Joseon government banned all settlements on most of its smaller islands, so as to avoid pirates and outlaws using them for refuge. This bit is important to the Korean argument for two reasons. Firstly, they argue that the ban was the main reason why the islets were uninhabited. And secondly, they argued that the lack of inhabitants indicates that the Joseon government exercised its sovereignty on Dr. Takashima by enforcing this policy. The Japanese, however, disagree. They argue instead that the Dr. Takashima islets never belonged to the ancient Usengu kingdom or any other Korean kingdom for that matter. According to them, the crocs were terrenolius, meaning land that didn't officially belong to anybody. However, the Japanese do also argue that the rocks were frequently used by Japanese fishers since at least the 1600s and considered Japanese territory even if not officially so. Whatever the case, the question over who really owns these rocks seems to first arise in the 17th century. During this period, clashes between Korean and Japanese fishers in the surrounding waters became frequent, which led to negotiations between Korean and Japanese governments. The resulting agreement vaguely delineated the fishing grounds of both nations, but today both sides have different interpretations of what the agreement really says. According to the Koreans, the Japanese acknowledged Korean sovereignty over Ulengdo as well as Dr. Takashima, while the Japanese argue it only recognized Ulengdo as Korean territory and not Dr. Takashima. Afterwards, it would not be until a few hundred years later that the Dr. Takashima rocks became an issue again. In the 19th century, the political landscape in East Asia was changing drastically, as Western powers increasingly gained influence in the region. In these times of great upheaval, the Joseon government held on to an isolationist policy for a long time, not wanting to adapt to the new order imposed by the imperial powers until it was already much behind its bigger neighbor, Japan. After a series of internal struggles, Japan had left its isolationism and feudal structures behind to modernize and become a new imperial force in Asia. As such, Japan was keen on expanding its influence and among the perfect targets for it was the Korean Peninsula. But Japan was not without competition. Russia was also seeking to expand its influence in the same regions, which put the two powers on a collision course. In 1904, these tensions escalated into the Russo-Japanese War. One year later, while the war was still raging on, the Japanese government decided to annex the Dr. Takashima rocks as terra nullius. This served to better monitor Russian fleet movements in the nearby waters and to appease Japanese fishers who wanted the rocks to be formally incorporated into Japan for a while. When the Joseon government got wind of the annexation a few years later, they formally objected but with no success. After Japan's victory over Russia, Korea would fall under the sole influence of Tokyo and in 1910 the entirety of the peninsula would be formally incorporated into the Japanese Empire, thereby temporarily ending the dispute over Dr. Takashima. Japanese rule in Korea was harsh and many issues which plague the Korean-Japanese relationship today stem from this time, such as Japan's use of Korean forced labor and the comfort women controversy 
but more on that later. A few decades afterwards, World War II would change the region forever again. What is important here is the result. Japan, which had built a vast empire across Asia before and during the war, was defeated by the Allies and capitulated after two devastating nuclear strikes. Then, a lengthy negotiation process began in which the post-war order of Asia was to be established. I will oversimplify, but during these negotiations it was clear that Japan would have to basically renounce all territories which were acquired through war, greed and violence since the start of its imperial expansion. But in a few cases it was unclear whether Japan had acquired certain territories illegally or not. One of those was the Senkaku Diaoyu Islands, which I covered in my first video, which you might want to check out afterwards. And another case was the subject of this video, the Dokdo Takashima Rocks. As mentioned before, the Japanese argued that the rocks were annexed as terra nullius and therefore acquired legally, since according to them, nobody owned them before, while the Koreans argue that they were part of Korea before the annexation and therefore must be given back. During the peace treaty negotiations in San Francisco, the Dokdo Takashima question was subject of debate multiple times, but eventually the Allies decided to not take a stance on the issue within the 1951 peace treaty, thus leaving the issue to be resolved bilaterally between Korea and Japan. But of course, it wouldn't come to that. While the Korean War was still going on between Communist North Korea and Nationalist South Korea, Control over Dr. Takashima increasingly became contested between South Korea and Japan. Between 1950 and 1954, there were legitimate fears that the conflict could escalate as clashes between fishermen and civilian activists from both sides were soon followed by violent skirmishes between armed coast guards. The situation remained volatile until 1954 when the Korean government decided to permanently enforce its control by building a lighthouse and coast guard base on the rocks. This of course angered the Japanese, who argued that the occupation was illegal. At this point, the relationship between South Korea and Japan seemed to only go downhill, but there was someone who wasn't having none of it, the United States. To contain the spread of communism in East Asia, the United States exerted a lot of pressure on the South Korean and Japanese governments to finally normalize relations and cooperate. The following negotiations were tedious and often broken off as these pesky little rocks would continue to stay in the way of normalization for more than a decade. But in 1965, after enough pressure from the US, both governments simply agreed to disagree, leaving the question of who owns Dr. Takashima unanswered in the normalization treaty. This immediately intensified cooperation between South Korea and Japan and the situation remained fairly quiet due to the increasing importance of economic cooperation. But in the 1990s it became apparent that simply ignoring the issue was not a viable long-term strategy. There were several factors which made the Dokdo Takashima conflict grow in importance during this decade. For instance, South Korea had undergone full democratization only recently, in 1987, which made issues like Dr. Takashima a more important political talking point. Meanwhile, the Cold War was coming to an end with the breakup of the Soviet Union, which allowed for other political issues to come to the forefront. While there were surely more causes, a cycle established itself in which Korean and Japanese activists and lawmakers would regularly provoke each other and thereby causing large-scale public outcries and even the occasional suspension of diplomatic relations which would then quiet down until the next provocation would happen. And this cycle would repeat a lot. In 2004, South Korea printed post stamps with pictures of the rocks on them. This caused protests across Japan and strained diplomatic relations for weeks. And in 2005, Japan's Shimane prefecture, which officially claims the rocks as part of its territory, introduced an annual festival known as Takashima Day, which celebrates the annexation of the rocks more than a century ago. Since then, the event sparks yearly protests in South Korea and the South Korean government suspends diplomatic relations with Japan multiple times because of it. The last time these rocks were in the news before the making of this video was in the middle of 2021 when Japan released this map for its Olympic Games. What's so controversial about it? Well, if we zoom in right here, you might discover this.
No, this is not a smudge on your display, but a barely visible grey dot representing the disputed rocks. Which of course, was not well received in South Korea. Now, what does this tell us about the conflict and why it continues to plague the two countries' relationship? Well, Dokdo Takashima is the last remaining territorial dispute between South Korea and Japan, and as such, it carries with it the entire weight of the tragic history between those two countries. For many South Koreans, the Dokdo Takashima rocks are directly linked to all the injustices the nation experienced during Japanese colonial rule, including forced labor, the forced prostitution of Korean women and the overall oppression of Korean culture. And in addition to that, many also feel that Japan is not appropriately apologizing for these injustices, an issue that regularly pops up during the various textbook controversies. The struggle against Japan also contributed in shaping the Korean identity, not only as a result of the 20th century colonial period, but also stretching as far back as the 16th century during the so-called Imjin War, the first Japanese invasion of Korea, a war in which some of Korea's most celebrated national heroes fought against the Japanese. This historic symbolism is also why this is one of the few issues in which North and South Korea are in agreement. Meanwhile, in Japan, the Dokdo Takashima rocks are also perceived as an important symbol for Japan. Many Japanese feel that the imperial past is being exploited by neighboring states to undermine its national pride and civilizational accomplishments, but also to chip away and to threaten the territorial integrity of the country. And for many of them, the Dokdo Takashima rocks are a prime example of that. So, how can this issue be solved? Well, Relinquishing the claim to the rocks would be seen as an incredible injustice in both South Korea and Japan, no matter their real material worth. Therefore, it is highly unlikely that this issue will be resolved as long as the historic baggage between the two countries has not been put behind. I hope this video helped you understand this issue a little bit more. You might have noticed that this video featured some amazing art. That's because it wasn't done by me but by my friend and Korean artist T-Bag, who is also part of the artist team working for Kraut. He has a Twitter, which I highly recommend you check out. And he's open for commissions, so if you need some art, Paul and Paul related or otherwise, you can hit him up. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.